Warning, Tongue and Geek contains heavy spoilers. If you haven't read, watched, or played the content being reviewed this episode, know that we will definitely spoil major plot points. Also, this show isn't for kids. We use words like f***, and c***, and it would take too much time and effort to edit them all out. Please don't tell our moms. Lovely listeners, welcome to Tongue in Geek, Season 3, where two more white guys on the internet share their unsolicited opinions on all things geeky. I'm Isaac. I'm Tyler. Heck yeah. To kick off Season 3, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about some of the cool stuff that came out last year that we just didn't have time to talk about previously. Uh, to keep this from degrading into some sort of rambling, unplanned, sort of no, freeform structure, uh, we're going to do a very highly structured, well-planned out award show. Each entry that's been meticulously deliberated, uh, very thoughtfully considered, lots of foreplanning on our part, uh, to make sure that you get this very very well planned high quality episode so welcome lovely listeners to the first annual tongue and geek award show clever title pending <laughs> just edit in your voice with the clever title later nope that's that's welcome to the <laughs> da, 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 show no, yeah. that's the official title is clever title pending <laughs> here are the rules Two simple rules. Oh God, you got a whole thing going. Mm hmm. We we all right. <laughs> we planned this out meticulously in advance, Tyler. Months of preparation and forethought. <clears throat> Rule number maybe one. Just say my, maybe my character development in last season didn't stick. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number one: awards can only go to media that was released in 2022. It can be like okay, a part well, of a I figured that was the case. Yeah, it can be part of like a season of a show that came out, you know, that year, but the show didn't start that year. But like the media itself had to have a release of some kind in 2022. Second rule, none of the content we previously reviewed are eligible for these awards. We've already talked about them at length. We already told you what we liked about them or what we didn't like. We're focusing only on stuff we didn't get to touch on. So, Tyler. What is your yes. first award that you would like to give out for the evening? Oh, God. My <laughs> first award from my extensive <laughs> list of awards mm -hmm. and sub-awards and categories. Mm -hmm. and Lots of nominees on the table. You want to just start off with maybe some of your nominees? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. I, I, I got something here. I just need to confirm dates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Fuck, what's the name of it? Yeah, no. no. My favorite thing that I'm going to mention soon. Uh, oh, you're starting out with oh. the number one. Oh, wow. That's a real reversal of most well, award shows. I, I figured I figured I'd throw a wrench in here. Okay. A curve. No, ball, yeah. We usually ball. build up to that, but, you know, I like this change in formula we're doing, really standing apart from other award shows. Well, because I, I figured you would just assume that I would just movies, movies, movies. Mm -hmm. But I figured I would first mention an album. Album. A album. We have not reviewed music, music before. Interesting. So, what have you got for yes. us? Best music of 2022. I'm. I love music. Everybody loves music, but I'm not like a as big a music guy as I'm a movie guy. So, I didn't listen to much new music that came out last year, 2022. But the best thing that I listened to was indeed Bronco by Orville Peck. Came out uh, April, all the way back in April. Oh, God, it's almost been a year since this album dropped. Jesus Christ. That's how time works. Anyway. I feel like with some about, of these uh, entries we're going to talk about, we're really going to feel the passage of time this year because I felt them looking back and being like, that was this year. I thought that was a decade ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's disgusting. Stop. Stop getting existential. We're talking about Orville Peck. We're talking about Bronco. Talking about Branca. Wow. Uh, trying to talk about music. This is different. Okay, um, let's put it this way. Uh, when it comes to music, I avoided country like, should I say the plague? Is that faux pas now? Eh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
did not did not want country did not like country i thought it was all annoying obnoxious twangy bullshit Mm -hmm. and if it wasn't annoying and twangy it was just boring and twangy that was what i considered the whole of country music (laughs) but then i clicked on a video a couple years ago for orville peck's dead of night which was on his first album i'm like hey that guy looks cool he's wearing a cowboy hat and a fringy mask click (laughs) <laughs> and I get this beautiful melancholic, like dreamy, just like pop. It's not even pop country. It's like shoegaze country. Um, shoegaze is a music genre. Um, just in case anybody doesn't know that, I'm not going to get into what it is, but it's a genre. And I fell in love ever since. He single handedly made me appreciate country and made me start exploring the genre. Mm. Um, it just if uh, he his his star is on the rise. Bronco is it's, it's it's a bigger album than his first album Pony. It's it, it's more dynamic in its tone. It's you know a, a real sad, depressing, romantic ballad here, and then a kick-ass rocking country banger there, and then it's more. Yeah, operatic tell us about some of the, the songs album. on the album. Tell us about some <laughs> I of the can't. songs. In I don't particular. know how to talk about music. <laughs> <laughs> um, Name one of the songs on the album aside from should the I name like, a title song, song on the album. <laughs> Besides from the title well, song, there Bronco. Is the title song. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, um, it's, it's a bit of a longer album. Um, it's I think it's fifteen tracks, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, yep. Pretty much every song on it is a is a banger. But my favorite is Kalahari Down, which is one of the the melancholy tearjerker ballads. We saw him in concert, Erica and I, this year for the Bronco tour. And uh, when he when he hits that that peak in Kalahari down and fans of the song will know the goosebump moment dude live let me tell you tears <laughs> tears funny that you mentioned tears this is one of my things to look forward for 2023 i am looking forward to crying the, more the legend of zelda <laughs> tears 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 i don't i haven't actually heard it pronounced out loud so i don't know if it's supposed to be tears or tears tears of the kingdom which is the direct sequel to I would Breath assume of the Wild. it's Tears of the Kingdom because Tears of the Kingdom sounds stupid as shit. I don't know. Maybe so they're tearing the, the kingdom apart. But it's the direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, which everyone who has ever played a video game in the last 10 years would know was a massive success, revolutionized the open world genre. Um, so that's one of my big 2023 hops looking forward. Okay. Another curveball. Another curveball. Is it a curveball? I like... Well, because I went from talking about my favorite album to you being like, this is what I'm looking forward to this year. Oh, no. Totally structured. (laughs) There is... there is. I'm sure people listening... Oh, that's right. That is the... Oh, yeah. Okay, it's on the list. (laughs) Sorry. My bad. People listening back to this... Here's the thing. From the start of this episode, people are not going to understand how the structure works until we get to the end when we've created this elaborate awards puzzle for them like this award yes, show this is interactive exactly there is there's a secret code the, you can only figure out what wins our top pick by figuring out all of the secret messages inside of this episode yes hopefully you guys downloaded the app uh for this yeah <laughs> make sure you get your qr scanners uh you're- this is a doozy of an arg that we're putting on here. <laughs> What's your forced forced My forced award? (laughs) My first award is the Cool Concept Award. This award goes to the project Mm -hmm. that most masterfully presents and executes a unique idea or ideas that break the mold standing apart from other media. And for my... Fuck, you really thought about this. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We both, we both, both put so much thought and effort into this. Oh, of course. Preparation. Our approaches are so different. Different, different styles, of course. Uh, my winner for the Cool Concept Award this year goes to Spy X Family. Uh, bleh, Spy X Family. <laughs> I blew it there. On family. The, family. <laughs> family. A Spy X Family. <laughs> uh, an anime TV series based on the manga by Tatsuya Endo. It's produced by Wit Studio and Clever Works, available on Crunchyroll and Hulu. It's got a very simple but very useful premise in that a spy based in a fictional world that's very heavily based on uh, Germany during the Cold War with, like, East and West Germany, is trying to stop a war from breaking out. And in order to do so, he has to disguise himself as a family man, get himself a wife and child. In the process of doing this, he unwittingly adopts a child who is an esper who can, like, read minds like a telepath. (laughs) 
and then ma- marries a woman who turns out to be an assassin. So you have these three different people. All of them have their own like secrets that they're hiding from each other. And it just leads into these chaotic, hilarious and surprisingly heartfelt scenarios where all of these characters are trying to hide their secrets. They all have their own motives for being a part of this family. And they're slowly, gradually learning to accept each other as a real family and not just a show they're putting on for each other. Shit, that sounds pretty fucking good. If only I was into anime. If only that was just another thing that I can jump into. <laughs> you had a bit there. You just get that bit going I did, again. I did. I just, I'm, I'm such a boomer. Like, cause I have, I have my movies and I just have my movies. And if I'm watching an anime, which are historically long, then I, that's like six movies that I could have watched that I've never seen before. That's so. every television series, Tyler. You just described it. I know, which is why I series. barely watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> barely watch tv <laughs> oh this is a good that's a good segue tv i don't think i watched a single 2022 premiere show really last year i mean i probably did i just can't recall what it would be i guess my favorite tv show of 2022 it's probably the only thing that had a new season that i saw uh would be white lotus uh we got into white lotus not too long ago a couple months ago and season two premiered this year, and it was not nearly as good as season one, which seems to be the unpopular thing. <laughs> but, um... It's my favorite television. This is uh, not really great stuff, but like my favorite for the year. <laughs> me, me picking White Lotus is only literally carried by the fact that the first season is fucking perfect. And the second season, while worth the time just is not nearly as amazingly put together as the first season. What a ringing endorsement but, um, for our award show. <laughs> Could you imagine if at Again, the Oscars they were like, according this to the internet really though, great. that is the unpopular take. <laughs> imagine if at the Oscars somebody like presented a winner for one of the awards and like, it was really great, but like it's the only thing we watched <laughs> this year, so... <laughs> I know that there's got to be something new to, along with that, but I wasn't there a new season of What We Do in the Shadows? <laughs> yeah, but which was go- which was good, but I guess technically I we've talked I, about I'm, the series. I'm thinking as a whole, of like so I'm thinking of new off. shows, new show. Oh well, your rule was it just had to be released in 2022. Well, well the second TV, rule was I was that thinking it like something, something that, that came out in 2022. Right. Well, I mean, there was what we do in the shadows, but the second rule was that we couldn't talk about something we've already talked about before. Although we technically hadn't talked about that season of what we, whatever. White Lotus is your pick for TV and you've left us a ringing endorsement of it. I am (laughs) definitely, I'm not even going to watch season one. Skip right on over to season two. (laughs) Well, it's anthology, so you could go to season two if you want. Um, I didn't say what the fuck it was about in any capacity, did I? No, you didn't. Do you care to elaborate? It's a character-based, dark comedy drama. Short pitch is that it's about shitty white people at resorts being shitty and a big commentary on rich people and class Mm. and the intersection therein. Okay. Fun for the whole family. Really. Fun for the whole family. The best thing that Tyler watched being the only thing that he watched this year. (laughs) In terms of television. In, in terms of new 2022 television. Mm-hmm. I'm going to break it up again. Well, that about wraps it up. For- <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to break it up again with another bit of 2023 hop. Another thing that I'm hopped for is Spider-Man 2, the video game coming out. The sequel to Marvel's Spider-Man that was released on PlayStation 4 and 5. Oh, they're making a Spider-Man 2 game based off the Maguire movie? Yeah! It was released in, like, 2004. <laughs> I was making a really lame joke because it's yes, no, we, Spider-Man 2. And- yeah, it is just called Spider-Man 2, but I'm very excited. Uh, you know, I really love the first one. I still need to play Miles Morales. Um, I've heard it's not as good as the first Spider-Man game, but I'm, I really love the first Spider-Man game in this series, and I really hope the second one lives up to it. It's going to have Venom in it, which will be awesome. Don't know who all else Voiced is Voiced by Tony actually. Todd, by the way, the Candyman oh, really? himself. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Who else is in this one? There's a few other characters. They got sort of like an ensemble thing going. Was Craven in this one? I don't. I haven't been keeping up with the news in the story. I just know it's um, Miles and Peter team up. Yeah, because My- Miles is like his protege in this one. Harry's supposed to be Harry Venom. Was a, 
Yeah. Harry was only a char- like a voice character in the first game, right? He didn't yeah. really remember him showing up. Physically. Yeah, he never showed up, and then it was revealed at the end of the first one, spoilers, I guess, for the first Spider-Man, that he was in some <laughs> sort of coma with some kind of disease, and his father, Norman, was trying to heal him, but he was using, like, the symbiote the to do symbiote. it. So that's going to be cool. I should replay. Heck yeah, it's a good one. The DLC is great, too, all of the DLC. Uh, so that's a bit of 2023 hop. On to my second award, the Eye Candy Award. Mm. This one goes to the most visually impressive project, a work of art that pushes the aesthetic boundaries of its medium. For this one... Oh, and here I thought we were going to get uh, un PC and start talking about hotties with bodies. No. <laughs> no. We can maybe do hottest actress award if you want to be a sicko. But we can... <laughs> that's a separate award. This one goes to Pinocchio, an animated film directed by Guillermo del Toro and Mark Gustafsson, available on Netflix. That was going to be my pick for favorite animated feature. Well, it's technically not my favorite animated feature because my favorite movie of the year, well, two of my favorite movies of the year are animated, technically. Really? But um, as far as... <laughs> you're probably going to be like, oh, bullshit. But um, as far as family... Uh, acceptable animation. Um, <laughs> Pinocchio is my f- is my favorite of the year. Um, it's Guillermo del Toro, so you know to expect the a bit more under the surface. Mm-hmm. It's probably the most overtly supernatural and magical Pinocchio adaptation. Absolutely, it's got heavy themes of death in it. Surprisingly, it's a, it's a lot stranger than other interpretations of Tokyo. Spe- Very strange. Yeah, much different than the shitty. Shitty Pinocchio remake that they did for Disney. I keep forgetting that actually came out. That happened year. this. No, yeah, it happened that same year. Yeah. Uh, but this blew that out yeah, of the water. I, I didn't know it existed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Phenomenal stop motion animation. Um, there's just some beautiful, beautiful sets in this film. Uh, it's all set in like the Italian countryside during this time period between World War One and World War Two in like fascist Italy. It's just so gorgeous to look at and Pinocchio himself is so well designed in that you know other interpretations we've seen he's just like a typical puppet you know and he's got the growing nose and whatnot but here he's like this grotesque sort of asymmetrical puppet that like his father made in a drunken stupor out of grief for the son he lost it's 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 beautiful. God, what a fucking heavy movie. <laughs> it's so heavy and so beautiful. The blue fairy has this fantastic, like, biblically accurate angel design. It's just, like, almost terrifying in the way she looks. Uh, both of them, actually. There's a second blue fairy of a different kind that exists in the afterlife. Um, it's just, it's gorgeous to look at. <laughs> right now, people are thinking, this is a Pinocchio movie? What the fuck are you I know. About? Monstro's <laughs> cool. Monstro's not just a big whale. He's like this yeah. weird sea beast. Gert- Fish. Yeah. Yeah. Just beautiful. It's some of the best stop motion animation that I've seen in easily a decade. Yeah. If you, and if you've ever wanted to see a story where um, Pinocchio is inducted into fascist youth, yeah. this is the film for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, and if you want to fucking ball your eyes out at the <laughs> sheer sadness <laughs> of the ending of this movie. Yeah. Highly recommend. It's, it's a film that hit, hits on some heady, deep themes. It's it. I am glad. I am glad that I was home alone when I watched it mm-hmm. because, like I've, I've made mention before mm-hmm. here, um, everything makes me cry now if I'm even mildly invested in it. And when the last like five minutes of Pinocchio happened, I just, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> like, just ugly crying, ugly crying. Beautiful movie, beautiful movie. Uh, so that's my award. Tyler, give us another award, please. Well, since we're on the subject of animation, I guess I will two movies share my favorite movie of the year spot. And I'll mention one that has a aesthetic similarity with Pinocchio. Uh, Phil Tippett's Mad God. Mad God. Um, Phil Tippett is an effects master who's been in the business for like 40-something years now. A quick footnote, not footnote, Um, I don't know what term I wanted to use there. He did the stop motion for the Snow Walkers in Empire Strikes Back, the ad ads. Mm-hmm. He did stop motion for the police robot in First Robocop. He helped develop the special effects uh, for the first Jurassic Park. He's he's just he's 
he's been around forever, Phil Tippett. And this project, Mad God, is primarily stop motion. There are some live action elements mixed in. It's basically just this wordless industrial descent into hell. Um, he worked on it off and on for like over a decade with just like himself and the people in his workshop. Mm -hmm. And the narrative is purely visual. It's obviously biblical because there's an opening scroll and then, then through the imagery alone you see that it basically etches out to this biblical struggle between like a world from like a from like two Satan slash God figure. It has some of the most disturbing and awe inspiring images I've ever seen in an animated movie. And it's stop motion, so you know it's like got this uncanny uh, visual sense mm -hmm. to it. There's really no use in trying to describe it audibly because it's just something that you have to see for yourself. Um, it's called Mad God. Um, it's streaming on Shudder. And uh, it should be... Yeah, yeah, it came out on Blu-ray recently. Mm -hmm. If anybody who loves stop motion animation and is just interested in unique narratives, unique visuals, check it out. It's amazing. All right. And what was your second favorite animated film of this year? <sighs> my second favorite animated film is a tie with Mad God as my favorite movie in general of last year. I'm going to come out and say it. I don't care. Avatar the Way of Water, baby. Ah. <laughs> Um, I don't want to get into how annoying the discourse is about the Avatar movies. Um, really? Like, <laughs> like discourse is about everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's everything blockbuster filmmaking should be. And mm. from James Cameron, so you know it's of the utmost precision mm -hmm. in structure and pacing and mm -hmm. editing and shot composition. Um, of course, it's absolutely fucking gorgeous. Uh, there's probably no controversy in saying that Avatar 2 has the best CGI ever created for a movie after the first Avatar. And I just want to gloat, you know, proving the haters wrong. It's already the sixth highest grossing movie of all time. It's only going to be higher. Uh, so there's your cultural impact, bitches. Mm -hmm. And we all know that a film's merit is in the money that it makes. <laughs> we all know that that's the you know that single... You know that wasn't... You know that, that wasn't the, the point That is the single making, defining so quality that determines a, an art's piece worth is monetary value. <laughs> don't be a jackass. You know that's not the point I was making. <laughs> so... I am worried because i think the third avatar is scheduled to release in the same week as the third sonic the hedgehog movie and one of them needs to move yeah. because yeah. that is not going to work out well <laughs> much as i love avatar i don't know if it can stand up exactly it's going to get his ass kicked uh, i actually watched avatar way of water last night oh it did not make guess. my list i didn't like it <laughs> I I will say I have the exact same reaction to this film as I did to the original film. Actually, no, I like the original film more, which is sad <laughs> because I do not like the original well, film no that much. For taste, so uh... the original film, <laughs> anyway. I was inc like everyone else. I was incredibly blown away by the visuals the first time I saw it, and then over time, I gradually lost interest in it as. Yeah, the story really didn't grip me much. This one, like Tyler said, it's probably the most impressive CGI to date. The problem is that it's not as much of a mind blow as the first one was. It's not as far ahead. I've seen stuff closer to this than I did at the time period that the original Avatar came out. This one didn't blow me out of the water like the first one did. <laughs> but um, And again, I really don't care for the story that much so but that's tyler's fake not mine uh, if only you saw what of water i did it was okay <laughs> <laughs> good for a one -time. anyway now that uh now that isaac's brought down the mood um <laughs> on to our ne next category yeah you've done two back to back let me do two back to back um, next category for me is the Laugh Out Loud Award. This one goes to the funniest project, one whose comedy is both clever and impactful. For me, this one goes to 
Monster Prom 3 Monster Road Trip, a video game developed by Beautiful Glitch, available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It is the third in the series of Monster Prom, which is a series where you date monsters and take them to prom. Although the first one was prom, the second one was summer camp, and this one, obviously, is road trip. I just can't really put into words how much this game is my style of humor. It's... It gets Tell me about it. <laughs> raunchy, it gets weird, it gets violent, it does all of the s- silly, immature crap that I just love to see without ever l- feeling too childish to the point where it's like, okay, I am not like this feels like middle school stuff. It's clever. It's fun. It's like well thought out in its comedy, but it's just so over the top ridiculous. The main cast is a ghost and a werewolf who are just the werewolf is a total himbo, super dumb. The ghost is a party girl. And then there's you who's trying to basically sleep around with any other monsters you come into contact with all while trying to survive on do. this. As yeah, you. as you do uh, on this crazy road trip, you're trying to survive. What makes this game great also is that it's cooperative, as in up to four players can play together in order to try and get like the ending that they desire. There's numerous paths, numerous endings, numerous scenarios, like hundreds, if not thousands of different scenarios you can go through, um, all with their own different branching options that all have their own different jokes for if you succeed, if you fail. It's just so well done and this weird, fun world that they've created in Monster Prom. It's this is a gr- it's probably my favorite so far of the Monster Prom games, which is saying something because I really love the first two. I played the second one with you guys. Um, you did. It was fun. I liked it. <laughs> um, I, I didn't. I didn't get with my pick. They uh, <laughs> broke my heart. So yeah, uh, happens, I was unreasonably <laughs> pissed off about it and hurt by it <laughs> because oh. I'm a child who can't play any dating sims without low key getting, getting his feelings hurt every time. Genuinely hurt. <laughs> the rejection's too real. <laughs> Um, best thing I can say about it is that I didn't actively want to quit playing it uh, five minutes into it um, <laughs> because s- simulation games like this and is would you even call, is this is that the even technical term simulation game this dating latest sim? it's the first two are definitely dating sims this third one kind of pushes the dating element to the side for more of a cooperative survival sim situation which, where you have to a, manage that's, your that's resources a cool twist on the yeah, yeah, that's like a you can on the concept of the game. You can date in it, but it's not like the main focus, which is a cool. It's it's good progression for the series. Yeah, uh, best thing I can say about it is I didn't actively want to stop playing it as soon as I started <laughs> because it's not my genre of of gameplay. Is mm-hmm. I, I find it largely boring, and it got me into a new band <laughs> I like because the end credit song is a bop. So I got into a new band because of that game. The second one, the second one's yeah, yeah. the second one. All of all of the end credit songs are bops, and I think they all have different bands, which is cool. So that was my first one. Yeah, you did two back to back. I'll do a sec- another one back to back. Second award is the Lovey <laughs> Surprise. W. It's Avatar Two: The Way of Water. Um, he was just <laughs> joking around yeah, earlier. My, my um, didn't make it on the he, list. He cried award. at all the. <laughs> <laughs> he cried at all the moments Tyler cried at, and he uh-huh. wants. A, uh, a a smart whale best friend, just like Loak. I don't. In the film. I don't know any of the children's names i think one of them's tookie they say them a million times yeah no and i didn't t- care tookie. <laughs> tookie cookie where's your oh, heart it's the it's like the most open-hearted fucking thing two of the four children don't out. matter two of the four children don't <laughs> matter child. eldest it's son it's and youngest daughter they don't do matter, matter. To the they story serve at all function in the story <laughs> not every character needs like some an arc emotional depth for, for them to work within a story <laughs> anyway i'm not here to shit on your awards i'm here to present my own <laughs> my second of the <clears throat> awards that i'll be presenting now at this juncture while it's my time uh is the lovey dovey award this one goes to a project that best represents loving relationships between two or more characters. The relationships themselves can be romantic or platonic, silly or serious, so long as the work masterfully explores the bond between the characters. And for this one, I have to give it to this. It is 
Our Flag Means Death, the live action TV series created by David Jenkins, available on HBO Max. Oh, that did come out this year. Right? Oh, that was the one where I was anyway, like, yeah. that was the one where I looked back. I'm like, whoa, wait, that was this year? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we touched on it briefly in one of our other episodes. We didn't dedicate an episode to it, but like, it's just, it's such, such good LGBTQ plus representation. It sets a new standard for queer rep in media. It's so masterfully done, this relationship between these two men who are both seeking things in their life of piracy that they only manage to find in their relationship to each other. It take it, it makes a genuinely emotional relationship work between these two men that's not driven by like stereotypes or over sexualization. It's it's just such a genuine relationship that the two main characters have and other characters too there's so many different ones going on in the story and it's all funny like taika watiti's in mm. this as uh, edward teach blackbeard and it's just it's so funny on top of being incredibly heartfelt and sincere so definitely our flag means death yeah i will i will co-sign on that one <laughs> um loved every minute of it yeah it's as far as just like romance goes it's like one of the few romances that's central to a story that i've seen in a while where i was wholly just like dead ass just on that ship just like yes ship in more ways than one yeah exactly i ship <laughs> hard i need them to get together <laughs> i need them <laughs> to be happy so investing <laughs> yes and i love the visuals of it i love the presentation mm -hmm. of it i it's stylized in a very storybook kind of way because you can tell that the ship is just a, a set of a ship. Yeah. And that they're like on a stage with like the ocean green screen behind them. It made me it, care about but pirates it's again. It's <laughs> yeah. It's perfectly um, purposely stylized in that way where it, it has just like this un layer of fantasy unreality mm -hmm. to the whole thing. And um, the, the whole crew you think like, man, there's a lot of side characters. How are they going to... But no, like, you managed to get endeared to pretty much every single one of them. Yeah. Over the course of just one season. I got to give props to Taika Waititi because lately he's been getting on the nerves. <laughs> um, and not just because he made two of some of the worst comic book movies of all time, but some of his supporting roles that I've seen him in lately have just kind of been like, oh, it's Taika Waititi being Taika mm -hmm. Waititi. But this one... And kind of... This one, he gets lost in the role of Blackbeard. Yeah. He's very empathetic and he's he's even intimidating when yes, he needs to he's be. such a fascinating character he's this powerful dangerous figure who like exudes menace at times and then at other times he's this silly whimsical you know i'm just out to have fun kind of guy and then other times you get like these really heartbreaking scenes where you see a man who doesn't know what he wants or what he wants to be and he's just sort of breaking down over it like he does such this such a complex performance and it's so well paired with Reese Darby's Steed Bonnet, who is this soft aristocrat who's just trying to get a taste of the adventure of the high seas, but is way out of his depth and is has his own host of problems he's dealing with. It's so good the relationship between them. Yeah, and, and, and the way the two characters skew, you know, tropes is mm -hmm. is, is so perfectly pitched because you'd figure you know the disparate elements to blackbeard's personality would like maybe feel forced at some point or, or feel kind of fakey just to you know heighten the drama in the conflict but no it's just it all feels like him you know that yeah i love the last episode because the last batch of episodes like he's softened up he's become kind of you know you know goofier and more relaxed and more compassionate and empathetic and you don't see scary blackbeard for a while and then mm -hmm. in the last episode where he you know takes back command from izzy hands love izzy hands what a bitch of a character <laughs> <laughs> like he spoilers he cuts the guy's toe off and like sticks it in his mouth and it's just like jesus <laughs> blackbeard yeah. doesn't fuck around and he's he's a villain you know he he's villain and protagonist at the same time a lot of the yeah time. yeah and so our flag steed, means to... <laughs> I was, oh yeah i was gonna uh, yeah. rave about steve but steve. yeah no go for it <laughs> steve now like you said you know soft aristocrat kind of prissy but 
you'd think they'd lean hard into the unlikable elements of that, but no. Steed, for as naive as he is and comes from privilege and stuff, he's just a sweetheart. Like, <laughs> like he want he's like he wants to be fair to his crew. You know, he's like available emotionally for them, and he wants to love and be loved. He's just. Yeah, and that all he's ties a very in. Very easy character to root for. And he, that all ties in because even though he's born from a wealthy life, he's had his own share of traumas that he's dealt with throughout his life. And I hate to say trauma bonding, but the two basically trauma bond. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very compelling relationship to see between these two figures. Um, I really am excited to see how they take it because the the events of this series are loosely based, based on real world events steed bonnet and edward teach were both real figures who met at some point but they were not this but the show does everything to explore these two characters relationship and it's just so good it's amazing how it's basically an historical fanfic that some like 19 year old history fangirl with like <laughs> like what if these two pirates met and a kiss yeah. <laughs> and they make it so S- natural so good so that's my uh that's the lovey dovey ward for this year so what's your next one tyler oh god you took a good one um i'll, I'll wrap it back around to avatar the way of water oh my god um the, f- the film is filled with fantastically i um, said your layered. next award not the same one <laughs> my my next award is a lovey dovey award like yours oh, for right. Avatar Boy Award. <laughs> I guess I didn't make a rule that lots, you can't lots double of, down. <laughs> lots of uh, rich character dynamic uh-huh. uh, to explore in this movie. Um, but because I'm a sucker for a boy and his or a child and theirs stories, um, the odd man out in the clan, the Sully clan, Loak, uh, you know, he, he bonds with a genius space whale and it's exactly as weird as it sounds and it it's beautiful and wondrous and like if Free Willy was like really fucking awesome. <laughs> Pyakin, the Tolkien, uh, he's probably the best character in the movie and uh, he's, he's a whale. <laughs> and he talks though and you can read his subtitles because they have full conversations because... Put your prejudices behind you just because they're a sea animal doesn't mean that they're not people in and of themselves. So, yeah, he's not just a smart whale. He's he's a full being with his own motivations and emotions and, 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 and traumatic past that <laughs> give him the best moments in the finale of the movie. Because, oh, my God, when he blocked the missile with his head, <laughs> I damn near jumped up and ran through the screen. <laughs> <clears throat> so yes, the connection between Pyakin and Loak in uh, Avatar: The Way of Water is my Lovey Dovey Award. Okay, I do like that the whales have tattoos. <laughs> I like that they took yeah, the time to tat cool. up the whales. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so there's. Let's go a bit away from the awards for a moment. And get back into some 2023 hop. I'm going to throw another one out here. Uh, speaking of the earlier Spider-Man, we also have Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse coming out. Got yeah, cosine. Cosine. <laughs> like, the first one is one of the, and not hy- hyperbolic in the least, is what I'm saying, probably one of the best animated movies of all. Absolutely. So, it's got, Across the Spider-Verse has got a big, big hill to climb, but I don't see it possibly being bad. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't think that's in the cards. I don't either. Like, and they've pushed the envelope so much further since the first one. Because the first one had, we had Miles. We had Peter B. Parker. We had the Peter Parker of Miles Dimension. We had Gwen Stacy. We had Spider-Ham. We had Spider-Man Noir. We had um, Penny B. Parker. So that's, what, seven Spider-Men? That's seven Spider-Men? Yeah. Now we have dozens. <laughs> like, we have yeah. hundreds of Spider-Men on screen. Uh, Spider-Man 2099 seems to be aimed to be the antagonist of this film, at least for the time being, from what we've seen. Like, but, but there's Spider-Man. But fleeting, so. Uh, obviously. Um, but there's Spider-Man from across so many different generations of the characters just lifespan we see like uh what's the name of the clone spider-man the one who's got like that bluish part on his outfit it's like when peter died for a little while and his clone took over is it ben parker yeah it's ben riley 
Ben Riley. Yeah, we've got him. We've got. And then I'm thinking then the back Kane, who is the <laughs> second clone, <laughs> who's Scarlet Spider. Yeah, the whole clone thing. Mm-hmm. Is... Woo. You anyway, can see, like, I think the PlayStation video game that we were just talking about, that Spider-Man's in this. There's just so many Spider-Men that are going to be in this. And clearly, they're not all going to have, like, a major point in the movie. But I've talked at length about how I kind of hate multiverse films. These are the exceptions. Because they just know how to take this character of Spider-Man, this identity of Spider-Man, and infuse so many different storytelling in elements into it. So I'm definitely excited for Across the Spider-Verse. Co-signed. And it's funny you mentioned multiverse. Uh, aren't you forgetting something? Oh, okay. Yeah, that did make my honorable mentions. I don't have a specific award for it, but everything, everywhere, all at once. The only other exception to my multiverse statement, I just said. <laughs> Not the only. I generally don't like the trend that we're moving with with multiverse stuff where it's just a stand-in for good ne- storytelling. But everything, everywhere, all at once absolutely took its premise of everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> such an odd film to even try to describe. It's a live action film direct, written and directed by Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. I think the Daniels together uh, available on Hulu mm-hmm. and Showtime. It follows like this middle aged Asian immigrant woman who works at a laundromat with her husband as she's just dealing with a midlife crisis and all of her family issues and then suddenly is thrown into the fact that like all of these different branching timelines, every different alternate path her life could have taken is crashing in all at once. Yeah, it's such a cool film. Didn't make any specific awards for me this year. Uh, maybe just because I saw it later in the year. I didn't see it when it came out, but definitely, definitely a good watch. Yeah, uh, it's one of those movies that there, every once in a while, this movie, the internet unanimously doesn't fight over like a little bitch. <laughs> and uh, for a while, everything, everywhere, all at once was that movie. How to pitch it in a way that doesn't ramble and we can move on. Um, It's like, to be reductive, it's like if like the best episode of Rick and Morty, eh, kind of a eh, reference now considering some news that came out. Yeah, Justin um, Roiland's like, shit. <laughs> yeah. If it was like the best episode of Rick and Morty with less vulgarity... 100% more sincerity and a big aching heart. Yeah. It's it's Rick and Morty with a heart and sincerity, basically. <laughs> it does hit on that sort of same sort of existential dread that Rick and Morty does with like the there's no meaning. And in just the whacked out universe. humor. Kind yeah, of. and the whacked out humor. But yeah, everything, everywhere, all oh. at once. Definitely a good one. So there was a hop and an, one of my honorable mentions... Uh, okay, so you did too, and I can co-sign on both of them pretty much, <laughs> and through an honorable mention. Do you have another? Um, award I guess or I'll anything? piggyback off of your hype for twenty twenty three because, as we've discussed numerous times already, completely planned this episode. Is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I thought I had something in mind, but then I realized it was twenty twenty four. I have nothing now. Oh, I think there's two <laughs> films that you're forgetting that are coming out this year that you were both probably pretty excited about. Well, we talked about Across the Spider-Verse. I don't want to pick another superhero movie. Like I'm kind of getting to that point where I'm jaded. But to throw Marvel a bone, to throw the MCU a bone, after all this time where we just shit on it <laughs> every episode, <laughs> this is a very big, bittersweet hype because I haven't been as excited for an MCU project in years as I am for Guardians Volume 3. Guardians Um, Volume 3 definitely is on the hype list. 1 and 2 are still probably my two favorite MCU movies. Definitely James Gunn so far is just like the only guy in the superhero game that can make that brand of humor still work and feel fresh because Mm -hmm. he and Joss Whedon you know, they, they were pretty much the architects for the house style of Marvel that we're in now. Yeah. But not everybody writes like James Gunn, so not everybody can pull it off. Everybody else He's the is the only one that's still making it work. Everybody else is imitating that style, and you can feel that imitation. I know. This one's going to be a heartbreaker. Yeah, it is. They're going to kill Rocket. <laughs> They're going to kill Rocket Raccoon. I'm going to watch Rac- Rocket Raccoon die. Tyler, I'm going to watch Rocket Raccoon I- die in theaters. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm gonna see a little raccoon boy with a gun get his head blown off by some weird maniac. <laughs> by Adam, whatever. Adam Warlock's gonna come in and blow Rocket's head off, and I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna cry like a little bitch boy. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, it's not gonna be Rocket because the the trailer telegraphs it too much with him. So it's the misdirection. He's not gonna die. It's gonna be somebody else. Unless they're double faking you. Unless they're double faking you, Tyler. <laughs> they kill somebody like halfway through and then at the end they kill Rocket. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they're making you it's think like, like they wouldn't be this obvious. And then they were. Drax might die too. I think the <sighs> actor for him, Dave Batista, is basically like, I'm out after this. So Funny he said that because I'm out after this too. Um, the reason why I said it was a bittersweet <laughs> hype for Guardians 3 is because after that comes out and... I have the utmost faith that it will deliver. I'm tapping out. I'm done. Uh, I cannot do any more Marvel. It's going to take can't. a god tier level fucking yeah. hype for a, an, an upcoming Marvel movie for me to care about. Maybe the like, next Spider Man when it comes like, out. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But like, I was so satisfied with No Way Home. Like, I'm kind of like, no more Spider Man. I'm good. Yeah. Let him rest for 10 years, please. Come back in 10 years. Speaking of coming back in 10 years, Shrek 5, baby. <laughs> Shrek 5's yes. on the way. When's that one come out? Is that this year? No, that's still a long way off. Is it still a long way off? They've been working on that thing forever. I don't think they've even announced the release date yet. If I, and if they did, it's not till like 2024 or 25. Yeah. They need to hurry up with that. That's a good segue, though, for one of my other awards. Yeah, I know that. I know why you brought it up. <laughs> yeah. This is the Villain Award. The Villain Award goes to the project with the most impressive antagonist or antagonists, which can be a group, person, or force that acts as both a satisfying obstacle to the protagonist's goals and a compelling character or concept in their own right, which, for me this year, goes to Puss in Boots, The Last Witch. Last Wish, not Witch. God, I'm stumbling all over my words. The Last Witch of Puss are you, Boots. Are you zooted as well? I'm not because zooted. Because I am mildly zooted. I'm not zooted. Suited. Yeah, you I'm can just, probably tell. I'm just a bumbler. <laughs> Directed by Joel Crawford in theaters still, as of this recording. Um, there are there are three villainous forces in Puss in Boots. Speaking of, holy crap, Italy has perfect timing for the cat movie. <laughs> can you hear her in the background just meowing? <laughs> it's the second time she's done that. No, She came in when we were talking about Catwoman. And <laughs> she, she just hears me talking about cats and she wants to get involved in the conversation. I guess she, yeah, she watched it as well, so she loved the film too. Puss in Boots is a sequel to a spinoff of Shrek. And it does not deserve to be nearly as good as it is. But hot damn, did they make a good movie for Puss in Boots The Last Wish. It is highly stylized in its animation. Very similar to Spider-Verse with that sort of like comic booky look with the action where they cut down on the frame rate and it makes them move faster almost. But I'm going to talk about the villains because that's what they won the award for. Okay. Three different antagonistic forces in here. We have Goldilocks and the Three Bears, which are probably the weakest of the villains, but they're still very fun. They're like a crime family. Uh, like the Goldilocks and the Three Bears crime family. All of them are very, like, thick Cockney accents. They have some really weirdly violent threats that they do. There's one part where one of the bears picks up the dog and is like, I'm gonna cut you from Poopa to Snooter. <laughs> <laughs> like this <laughs> this movie surprisingly like it pushes that PG pretty hard. I'm surprised it managed to keep there's sensors in this. There's sensor beeps because they wanted to swear and they just went for it. <laughs> um but they're probably the lowest of the antagonists. They're, they're very funny and very fun, but the you can totally see where their arc is going throughout the whole film. It's so obvious. The second best antagonist in the film is Jack Horner, played by John Mulaney. And holy shit, I forgot how much I missed, like, just a cartoonishly evil villain in an animated film. We don't get much of those anymore. Pixar and Disney are so obsessed with twist villains or, you know, like villains that have these complicated, they're not really villains, they're just antagonists. But like, Jack Horner's just a 
bastard. Like, he's literally holding the puppy at one point as a crossbow in its face. And what was a stroke of genius was that they paired him with Jiminy Cricket, because he's got this bag full of magical items, and he pulls out Jiminy Cricket at one point, and Jiminy Cricket the whole time is just being like, oh, I'm your conscience, Jack. I'm going to try and tell you to do right and be a good person. <laughs> and, like, it's just not working at all. And he's about to shoot the dog in the face, and Jiminy's like, you're not really going to shoot a puppy, are you, Jack? And he's just like, yeah, in the face. Why? <laughs> like, he's just like so into being evil. It's so fun. I've missed that. And his bag of tricks is so cool. He pulls out Excalibur at one point, and it's still stuck in the stone. And he just uses it like a golf club. He pulls out a phoenix and uses it as like a flamethrower. He's just such a fun bastard of an evil character. Best villain in Puss in Boots, and the one that really won this award for me is death itself this whole film is an analysis on like the the fear of death and how it controls us puss in boots is down to his last of his nine lives and he's suddenly realizing that he's not immortal and throughout the whole film he's being chased by this big white wolf who's carrying around like these two scythes who's been trying to kill him and it turns out it's the literal embodiment of death and he's genuinely terrifying like he whistles this weird tune every time he comes onto the scene he's got these bright glowing red eyes he just exudes menace in every scene he's in and you can feel the way that Puss, like Puss in Boots is terrified of him. It's just, it's such a good depiction of death, and the way that it pays off in the finale is so satisfying. Uh, I will also co-sign Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. It's got so many things going for it, most of which you touched upon, but um, because it takes place in the Shrek universe, we're used to that franchise, you know, putting its spin on fairy tale lore. This movie is the most refreshing, like, irreverent slash new take on fairy tale lore since the first. Yes. It's very inventive with how it utilizes fairy mm -hmm. tales. As much as I did like it, I don't like it as much as most people are liking it. And it's because of Goldilocks and the three bears. Didn't like them much? Um, I don't want to say they didn't need to be there because they tie into the, th the themes of the film and all that. And... You know, animated movies like to have a multitude of characters, and um, but they weren't bad. I enjoyed them okay, but it felt like they just took too much away from the narrative of Puss in Boots and what mm -hmm. he was doing. Because I'm I'm so invested in him and as a character and his arc and how like mature and personal it is and like. Every time it cut back to them, I felt like the, the stories focused on them too long and the humor around them is the least funny, in my opinion, in the movie. And like you said, like their arc is very, very telegraphed. Like it's not written as cleverly or as nuanced as Puss's is, which I guess it doesn't have to be because they're side characters, but still you can tell where it was going from the like first minute they were on screen. Mm -hmm. They just, they, they just, they kind of just take it down a notch for me. Like, the movie's, like, on when it's with Puss and his gang. And it's just, eh, a little bit off when it's with Goldilocks and the Three Bears. But other than that, the villains, Jack Horner, and especially the wolf, Death, is amazing. And and the twist of it being the personification of Death just takes the movie to a, a, a higher plane than it was than it was on before. Sit chills down my spine. The whole pick it up line. Like every time. Oh, it it's like you don't expect like no nobody cared about this movie. No. You know? <laughs> nobody expected <laughs> nobody to like, care. Puss in Boots 2? Yeah, like Puss in Boots 2, who cares? Like, why are they making a Puss in Boots 2? And then like everybody's like, oh my god, it's good. It's like really good. It's really and good. Like, oh my god, the villain. <laughs> Like, and I'm like, well, well, shit. Yeah, it's really freaking good. He's he's terrifying. He's such a good representation of death. Just 
so good. So good. And like I said, Jack Horner, hilarious. It's a great return to form for John Mulaney. Oh, his character design, though. His character design's great. He's it. gross looking. It's, it's great. He's got that tiny it's little great. face in the middle of a big fat head. He's all top heavy <laughs> with so like the big just, lumbering, uh, like almost gorilla arms over tiny itty bitty little legs. He's so tall, but he's almost like a Dorito, like a slice of pizza shape. Like he's so he's so visually <laughs> off putting. I kind of couldn't <laughs> like not 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 in a way that was an entertaining. Let's put it that way. Like I found him so aesthetically. You literally watched a movie base. called Mad God about hell beasts rendered in stop motion. You're telling me that you're more you're disturbed right, yes. by a C- like a CGI dude with a little face. That's more disturbing. You to knew. You. <laughs> I. It's. it's you know how things like that work for people. It's it's illogical. Your so brain ways, is like, so weird, man. Not like disturbing and like that like like freaked me mm-hmm. out. It's just it was so perfect in execution as to be too repulsive. <laughs> just like I'm like I want to fucking punch him in You're his supposed weird to. old man baby. <laughs> I know, but like it was in a way where it was like oh get a, uh, get him off his screen. I don't want to look at him anymore. Jiggling jowls, <laughs> his smug little grin every time that he was like, I don't really care that I'm losing a dozen men right now. I've got a magical bag full of tricks. Looks, it's a phoenix, and he just grabs its neck and uses it as a flamethrower. <laughs> oh, oh god, Ugh. so good. Most punchable villain of all time is little Jack, big Jack Horner, big so Jack Horner. <laughs> So that's my villain award. Um, another one from you, Tyler. I know you've got so many on your list. We still need to get through. I want to keep going with this. Uh, bringing up God Avatar damn Harry it! Potter, but <laughs> do not tell me villain. I'll spare do not you. tell me villain. The, the cologne I'll, of the uh, colonel in the first. He's a fan. It, it's so it's fantastic. It's so villain. fanficky, Tyler. This movie's so fanficky it's not, with its plot. It's really not. It's completely the main with, characters uh, have a bunch of kids whose names I've forgotten, and the clone of the bad guy from the first movie is the bad guy again. Like it's like we couldn't think of a new villain. Let's just do Colonel again. It's not couldn't think of a new villain. It's I want to use these characters because this is the story. Nobody cares about these characters. Uh, God, you're actually so wrong about that. Uh, if only you knew how wrong you were. But um, you wouldn't let me finish. You you had to jump in there and rip at me uh, what I was gonna say. But I'm not gonna do Avatar. Okay. I was stalling for time because I was trying to think of a new category or something that I could give. Uh, you bastard. I was giving you more time. I gave you more. Okay. Okay. Obviously, I, I, I mean to look it up because you had this prepped in advance. No, I, no, I'm not looking anything up. No, I'm I mean on your list. I'm mean something. on your list, not oh yeah. my list. Duh, I keep silly goose. I have my list and not, here. I don't mean like um, go- rapidly googling something because you didn't prepare because that would be crazy. You're right. That would be so unlike mm-hmm. me and my character development from mm-hmm. last season. You're, you're a media, God, what are our writers media doing? profession. That's <laughs> scripted. Tongue of Geek is filmed in front of a live back. studio audience. <laughs> Anyway, next on my list is Biggest Out of Nowhere Surprise. Oh. Yes. Um, I had no idea that this movie existed or was coming out. It dropped on HBO Max, which I guess that was the, the whole marketing ploy. Um, it is an Adult Swim produced live action film called Adult Swim Yule Log. Now, if you don't know what a Yule Log is, it's just video of... F- a fucking fireplace for Christmas mm-hmm. for us. You know, if you want some mood on your screen or some ASMR or something. But because it's from Adult Swim, you know it's going to get completely demented at some point. <laughs> it starts off just like a Yule Log video on YouTube. And mm-hmm. then it slowly starts introducing narrative elements. And for like the first five or more minutes, you're just watching like pairs of legs move past the Yule Log and they're they're talking <laughs> because they have just committed a murder. <laughs> and at first I was thinking, okay, like this is fun concept for like a 20 minute short film, but I swear to God, Adult Swim, if this whole movie is an hour and a half of a walked off <laughs> camera, like as a story happens around it, uh, like I'm going to fucking lose my mind. Mm-hmm. But the camera angle gradually um, moves back, farther back, farther back, farther back, 
And then about halfway through the movie switches to standard film narrative Mm -hmm. presentation. I I don't want to spoil it for anybody because let's just say it's supernatural. It's absurdist horror. It does so many crazy left turns. You have no idea where it's going from one minute to the next, but it makes it all worse. Surprised this didn't. It's just, I, we watched it on a whim because I saw it like kind of being virally hyped online. I'm like, Oh, okay. Okay. And I just was so happy with it. It was such a great little treat. Of <laughs> so it didn't, you didn't get to it until after the holiday season, which is why it didn't show up in tongue and cheer. I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right. That's your biggest surprise award. I'm going to move on to my last of the 2023 hop that I have listed. Uh, the super Mario bros movie coming out this year uh, from I was wondering. Illumination of All Studios, which when I heard that, <laughs> oh, I'll be the first to admit, I immediately dismissed it as it's going to be garbage. And then I saw the casting list and I'm like, this is going to be a special kind of garbage. They've got Chris Pratt as Mario. All of this casting is so weird. Oh, poor Chris Pratt. And then we got the first trailer dropped and holy shit. Jack Black's killing in his Bowser. The animation's beautiful. Beautiful. There's not... God, Isaac, what are you I don't doing? know. <laughs> Stroking out? What are you I doing? Just, I'm a stumbler. I'm a fumbler. I'm a fool. <laughs> Do you have too much biscuits and, and gravy no, for dinner? No, I What's just talk on? like this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I almost lost it when you said... <laughs> well, you didn't say puss and boots. You said, I said like, poos. <laughs> you <laughs> poops, poos, poos and boots and bus, bus. I get talking poos. I get talking too fast, and then my brain doesn't allow me to make the syllables come out right. <laughs> um, so Mario, it's gonna be good. <laughs> the trailers make it look really yeah. good. <laughs> Animation looks good. There's not a fart joke in sight. It's, it's but it's illumination, so <laughs> I'm I'm maintaining the hop. I think Nintendo got illumination on a leash and said, "Hey, if you're going to represent our character, you're damn well going to do the way we want you to do it." So, I just want to gloat and rub this in your face for a second cuz I don't know if you remember these conversations, but we had it a few times. Where I said, you know what movie I would love to see if an animated if an animation studio just made a straight Mario movie, just like just like copy the aesthetics of the games as much as you can and translate it to 3D animated yeah. film. I'd love to see like a semi serious like adventure comedy Mario game movie. And you're like, no, I don't know that. And here you are. <laughs> A couple years later, Tyler, chomping at the bit. To I'm see happy it. to be wrong. <laughs> Gloat all you like. I'm happy to be wrong. It looks genuinely good. Now, if it turns out to be a hot pile of dookie, I will throw this back in your face. But that's fine. But that's the way. This if works. I'm wrong, I still win. So I'm good. <laughs> I do want to make fun of a comment I saw about it. Oh, OK. Um, I'm very excited for it. And I don't think there's a chance I'll hate it unless it's just drastically unfunny, even if it's just a bunch of references from the various Mario games strung together for 90 minutes. If it's bright and colorful and doesn't actively make me want to bash my head in because it's not funny, I'll enjoy it. But somebody online said, it looks like shit. They're just like, it's just a nostalgia trip. They're just like recreating things in, in, in Mario games to like get you excited. I'm like, fucking duh. <laughs> Like, you want there to be a Mario movie without easily recognizable Mario iconography? We like, did that. How are you gonna? We did that in the <laughs> '90s. That film exists. <laughs> how are we gonna bitch that like a Mario movie has like <laughs> the tunnels and cheap cheeps <laughs> and shy guys in it that look game accurate? Oh mm. no, this Mario movie looks like a Mario game. They're just going for cheap nostalgia. <laughs> Like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. God damn it. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway. Anyway, that's um, the last of my hop for this year, at least that I can think of that I prepared in advance <laughs> on, on my list. That, 
that that you have and I definitely have. That you definitely yeah. have because yeah, I'm sure yours is even more meticulous than mine. <laughs> did you do the last award or did I do the last award? Well, you just did the last award because we were talking about Mario when it was your That's last. That's not an award. That's a, I guess it's, it counts. Okay, what's your next award? Well, okay. Okay. I would like to choose a movie that I would classify and categorize as movie that would gross Isaac out the most. Mm. Uh, this is the best movie that I saw last year that would disturb and gross out Isaac. Okay. Now, there are quite a few. <laughs> Uh, and this isn't the goriest movie that came out last year, but it is one of the more fucked up mainstream horror movies that came out last year. <laughs> Barbarian. I should have who directed it pulled up, uh, but I don't have it pulled up. I'm sure it's on your um, list. Is it, under, the... is it under some of the notes on your list? I'm sure. <laughs> I, I dropped my glasses and I can't see the list anymore. You sure? Take a closer look because so, I'm pretty sure looking under I'm, the sub I'm, notes, it says mm -hmm. directed by Zach Kreger. Yes, and he is uh, one of the yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. From it's right there in your list. Whitest kids it. you know of all. Really? Of all things. <laughs> yes. It's like a Yule log, the adults from Yule log, and you don't know where it's going. There are two points in the movie where it sharply pivots, and that either is going to lose people or just suck you in even more. It starts off one way, girl on a trip, Airbnb. Through circumstances of the plot, she's stuck in the Airbnb with a guy that's there as well. You think you kind of know what the story's going to be. Tw 30 minutes in, huge swerve. Then it turns into something else. And then like 20 minutes after that, another big swerve turns into something else again. I don't want to spoil anything about it, but the reason why I think that it would disturb Isaac the most is because at some point... A villain is trying to make one of the protagonists suckle from a very gross bottle of baby milk. Ew. Yeah. Gross. <laughs> no, you're right. That's, a, that's gross. Who is this villain? What are these circumstances? Why is it a bottle of baby milk? I shall milk? never because know. That, that is a clue. I shall never um, know. <laughs> you might not know, but then again... There's always Halloween. Oh, God. I'm in charge of Halloween this year. <laughs> There's always it's Christmas. <laughs> it's got to be at least vaguely Christmas themed, you ass. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to Tongue and Cheer uh, 2023. Today's film is Barbarian. <laughs> you got to at least, if you're going to do Christmas horror, at least do Christmas horror, you ass. I'm going to pick actual Halloween <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Bastard. Okay, so that was my Will Gross Isaac Got the Most Award for 20. All right. My next award is the Tearjerker Award. It goes to the project with the strongest emotional impact. A work that's. Oh my god, Avatar The Way of Water! <laughs> a work that sincerely pulls at the heartstrings without feeling forced <laughs> or contrived. And it's not Avatar The Way of Water. My Tearjerker Award, mine! <laughs> <laughs> goes to Epithet Erased, Prison of Plastic. This is a book. Oh, it's an anime. It's a book. <gasps> mm -hmm. I think breaking things up. Uh, written by Brendan Blaber. Uh, available in physical or digital copies or as an audiobook, which I highly recommend the audiobook. Um, it is entirely voice cast. Um, they have an entire voice cast. It's not just one person reading. A musical accompaniment as well. It's Fantastic! It basically plays out like a radio play um, in the audiobook. Uh, it's the sequel to the original Epithet Erased web series, which is all available for free online on YouTube. The general premise is that it's set in this world where a lot of people have superpowers based on their epithet, which is basically a word that gets inscribed into your soul. So the protagonist, uh, Molly Blondeff, her epithet is dumb which lets her dumb things down, perhaps by, you know, sort of like deafening things or making them smaller and more simple, uh, all of these different things. But she runs a toy store along with her father and sister, but she's the only one who is really doing any of the work around there. Uh, and her sister, whose epithet lets her basically create these huge fantasy worlds, doesn't do any of the work around the house, and constantly causes trouble for Molly. And the whole book is about these two sisters trying to work out their family trauma after their mother died, and they have to deal with moving on. It's just such a... It's a very funny book. It's very comedic, but 
when it hits it hits hard because it's this story about a little girl molly's only like 10 years old and she's barely holding it together she's doing her best to basically keep her family alive the book points out that she's literally malnourished and starving she's underweight for her age because they just don't eat enough her father's an absent idiot who's so obsessed with just making toys and then leaving his daughters to the actual business end of the toy store. It's it's so heavy in some of the messages it hits with, you know, family trauma, the way that people hurt each other in the wake of trauma. It gets it hits so hard. Sitting there listening to the audiobook, I I bawled like a bitch for like the entire last five or six chapters. It just, like, I don't think I've ever seen you shed tears in any media, media that we've shared together. So. Really? You've never noticed? Yeah. I get misty-eyed a you, lot. You might, you might have cried while we watched something before, but um, I, I, I never noticed. I, I get more misty-eyed, usually, instead of actual tears, like, rolling down the face. This one, this one had me crying. This one had me actually crying, because, to be fair, I was in a sort of emotionally vulnerable state when I listened to it, but, like, whew, it hits hard. And the ending is so, it's so well done, because it doesn't give you all the resolution you need, but it gives you just enough to realize that, like, these sort of problems don't go away within the confines of a single story. Like, they continue and have to be changed over time and it's it's so good i highly recommend it like i said the original epithet erased series it was originally an animated series but because of just the costs of doing that they decided to move over to the book format and um they still have the entire voice cast from the animated series working on it which is why the audiobook is so good voice acting is phenomenal but yeah very funny as well they do a great balancing of humor with drama and cannot stress enough it's phenomenal phenomenal emotional book oh man um i didn't read anything last year so (laughs) (laughs) no i didn't read anything that was published in 2020 (coughs) um that's funny but i did read i do read okay audience (laughs) i read books with words sometimes i finish them (laughs) so not um, sonic the hedgehog (laughs) when we get into that second arc (laughs) metal virus saga Um, win uh i'm split between two different categories i don't know which one i want to do because they're both once more heartwarming one's more do back to back do do the heartwarming such a do the heartwarming first and then completely break any sincerity (laughs) that you've developed with the funny one right after first category is yay i can't believe isaac and i like the same movie pretty much exactly the same amount (laughs) and that award goes to r r r yes oh god that was this year Yes, it was. <laughs> Wait a second. God I'm so it. sorry, Tyler. I'm so sorry. This does break one of the rules, which is that we cannot talk about media that we've already discussed. Oh, And we shit. did an entire episode on RR. It oh, is God. by far our business far. success of an episode. <laughs> Love you, India folks. Some of you weren't entirely on board with some of the stuff we said, but that's okay. <laughs> Oh, in my attempt to be heartfelt, I broke a It's rule. fine. It's fine. We all know the rules override genuine expression of We've emotion. talked at length about how phenomenal RRR is. If anybody wants to go back and we listen do. to our RRR pod, we both love that movie. What was your second category? God, can't believe you killed the... We did a three-hour pod on RRR. Here I we am. We have nothing connecting else. Connecting with... Here, here you are cutting off... My 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 love at the knees. We where I am going to be vulnerable to and explain how I liked watching. We didn't even watch it together, but our mutual enjoyment was so enthusiastic that I felt like I shared it's something. It's one of our longest buddy, episodes. You cut me off at we the have knees. nothing to add to that conversation. <laughs> you, you cut me off at the knees. It wasn't even about the movie so much as it was about. The <laughs> What was your other category? Uh, the funny one. My other category, the funny one, was Sonic the Hedgehog Two. <laughs> second favorite Pinocchio themed movie I saw <laughs> in twenty twenty two. How many? How many were there? It's a bit of. <laughs> it's 
it's a bit of a cheat because this movie did not come out in 2022, mm. but I did see it for the first time. So you broke both of these rules then. <laughs> yes. And the film in question is Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, The Toy Maker. Good God. <laughs> Burying the lead and calling it and describing it as Tokyo uh, Tokyo themed. Jesus, now you got me doing it. <laughs> Pinocchio themed because the Pinocchio twist. I mean, it's one of the villains' name is Joe Petto, so it's not Joe like Pe- it's like. Oh my god, I can't believe <laughs> I it. I want Joe Petto between <laughs> Joe Petto and Tokyo. Your little Tokyo slip. I want this to be like a Fast and the Furious spinoff with like. <laughs> Pinocchio behind the wheel or Pinocchio is the car and Joe Petto's dropping him <laughs> there's no there's no way that the reveal that the child of Joe Petto is an advanced toy that he created <laughs> unless you're like a two year old watching this movie you figure it out in like the first five minutes mm-hmm. of the movie so I'm not gonna feel precious about spoiling a 35 year old <laughs> movie about killer toys and mickey rooney is joe petto by the way um <laughs> what makes that funny <laughs> is that when the first silent night deadly night came out in the early 80s 1984 all of the karens got together and ran it out of theaters because gasp a guy is dressed like santa and killing people well one of the people that threw their weight behind the boycott was famous actor mickey tyler rooney. this is a 1991 um, film you are so far off of <laughs> You're so far off. I gave you two rules. <laughs> anyway, since Isaac's being a goddamn dictator, brevity's sake, what's funny is that Mickey Rooney went from boycotting the franchise to starring in it um, by the fifth, uh, not the fifth sequel, the fourth sequel. So um, I guess he needed the money. <sighs> um, but he's really great as Joe Petto. Almost too good. <laughs> like he's really good at playing a scummy old man. Yeah, and if you ever wanted to see uh roller skates turn into rockets and try to kill a kid, <laughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night Five, the toy maker. <laughs> Sorry, Mickey Rooney is Joe Petto. I was the sitting there like, okay, he's probably just a little bit off for twenty twenty two. And then I was like, wait <laughs> no. a second, Mickey Rooney? Hold hold on, how long has Mickey Rooney been dead? <laughs> 2014 the man died in 20 almost a decade ago this actor died and this film was almost over 10 years before that Which is nuts because he looks like he's 112 in this movie so i don't know how old Mickey he was Rooney born was. in 1945 like the man's was old oh god uh, anyway right. so, so both rules my award for second favorite Pinocchio themed movie of but you know it, it's great because this whole thing where I just you know bash you on the rules was scripted obviously you know because we both yeah. talked about these in advance mm-hmm. and we both were very very well prepared with our lists so obviously I'll, it, I'll add both to of be these honest, it was I almost I almost didn't want to do this episode because of how stressed the plan. I know got I know it, it it was pretty heavy. Um, you know there was a lot of debate on our entries here, what worked, what didn't, what we were allowed to argue over the whole Avatar debate. You know we went back and forth and back yeah, and forth. I, and like, sorry to spoil the joke here, but Isaac loves Avatar: The Way of Water, and he's just doing oh, yeah. This for Tyler the day, hates so. it. You know, it was honestly on my list first, <laughs> but then I had so many other entries. Tyler's like, I'll just I'll move that one over to my list. Just don't worry about it. Yep, completely, completely. Yep. And uh, I think we're selling it yeah, pretty well. Absolutely. Uh, the last of my category awards before we get into the big reveal and some other honorable mentions and whatnot. Last of my category awards is the World Building Award. Uh, The World Building Award goes to the project with the most impressively crafted setting, a work that masterfully integrates the story world's lore and design into the character's arcs and the main plot. And this... Avatar (laughs) Through the Water. Oh my god, you did it! (laughs) You did it! You know, Tyler, I enjoyed seeing that movie last night well enough, but the more you mention it, the more I realize I didn't like that movie. <laughs> right. You realize you yeah. loved it. 
Anyway, anyway, world building award. The world, to... my world building, my world building award <laughs> goes to God of War Ragnarok, the video game developed by Santa Monica Studio, uh, available on PlayStation Four and PlayStation Five, and the sequel to 2019's God of War. I'm. Th- this is an interesting entry because I'm still playing through this game. I have not finished it yet, but I had to give it an award because this one is. There's so much to praise for this game. I have a few critiques in terms of the story. The first game in this uh, more recent God of War series was uh, a much more concise story focusing on the relationship between Kratos and his son. This one gets a little more divided with issues of like war and no sabotage, things like that. But the world building in this game, holy crap, all of it takes place in Norse mythology. And we've seen all kinds of different interpretations of Norse mythology through all kinds of different uh, forms of media. You know, even the Thor films and Thor comics. I have never seen a sort of interpretation of Norse mythology this detailed, though. Every part of Norse mythology, because you can go to all of the nine realms that exist, you know, the realm of the elves, the realm of the fire giants, the realm of the uh, regular giants, the, you know, Asgard and Helheim, all these different worlds have their own unique histories, have their own unique cultures, have their own unique citizens and monsters and missions and designs. Like, it's all so beautifully crafted and all integrated into this journey of this oncoming war of Ragnarok. Uh, It's just, it's so impressive how much they've developed the world of Norse mythology into a place that you can actually see and walk through and engage with. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful game and visually beautiful as well. I haven't played a single video game again <laughs> in 2022. Um, so uh, that's another knock against me. I don't read video games. Tyler's the movie guy to the exclusion of everything else, apparently, because he watched one television show. <laughs> <laughs> one. It, and I fucked it up because it's not even new because it's season two. It's so. fine. It's, <laughs> hey, as long as it puts something out in 2022, that was fine. That was part of the criteria. But yeah, that's the last of my category Um, awards. Any final category awards from you before we get to best in show? Oh, yeah, the best in show. Now I don't know. Um, (laughs) Stalling for time is in the script. Well, while you stall for time, because we obviously put this into the script, it gives me a chance to very briefly go through some of my honorable mentions for the year. Uh, First up in my honorable mentions list is The Bad Guys, an animated movie made by DreamWorks, loosely based on the book series by Aaron Blaby, uh, directed by Pierre Parifel. It's available on Netflix, follows a series of anthropomorphic animal thieves with like the big bad wolf and a snake and a shark and a tarantula and a piranha who are all just these bad guys who go out doing crimes, stealing stuff, and then try to get reformed throughout the film. It's a very fun, very visually expressive movie. A lot of uh, good animation and quippy dialogue. Very fun film. Another recommend or an honorable mention for me is Drifting Home, an anime movie directed by Hiroyasu Ishida. Uh, It's available on Netflix. It follows a group of children who are trapped in an abandoned apartment building that somehow magically gets teleported into the middle of an ocean. Um, These kids find themselves adrift in this ocean where they come across all these different uh, abandoned structures that have ties to their pasts. Um, going through, they like learn a lot about what these different places meant to them. There's a this almost won my um, world building award because it's so much about the personal impact of place, and it's it's a very interesting film. A lot of fun. Go check it out. It's on Netflix. I already mentioned everything everywhere all at once. Great film. Inside Job. This one pisses me off. It's an animated TV series available on Netflix, created by Shion Tekuichi. It had its second season this year, or I think maybe just the second half of its first season, actually. Um, It's a very funny series based around... It's a workplace comedy based on Cognito Inc., which is basically like the Illuminati. They supposedly 
run all of the things, the governments, and do all the conspiracy theories. Uh, the series goes through all the different kinds of conspiracy theories and what they, like, how they're actually kind of right, but also kind of wrong, playing with a lot of jokes on that. But this series got cancelled by Netflix, even though it was moving on into its second season, I want to say, for no real good reason. It was really doing well. It had a growing fan base. A lot of people you know, gave it high reviews and it just got tossed the wayside by Netflix because they don't know how to keep good shows going. I know yeah, that's uh, kind of a uh, thing now with pretty much every streamer. So, um, yeah. HBO Max had its whole bullshit too. With still think, having its whole bullshit. Yeah, animation in particular has gotten a heavy shaft from some of these people. Next up in my honorable mentions, Primal, the animated TV series by Gindy Tartakovsky. Uh, we've talked about it briefly in other episodes, but oh, it's its second season, uh, which is available on Adult Swim and HBO Max. Beautiful. Um, every bit as impactful and stunning as the first season was it's action-packed it's heavy without resorting to dialogue it's got some fascinating world building what i love about this season of primal is that it refuses to pick a time period <laughs> it's it's, <laughs> it's, sure. well, it's the first season did too but this one this one especially it, it has a caveman and dinosaurs alongside vikings and like some sort of african empress who has like a battleship that goes around to all these different cultures and conquers like they refuse to pick a time period that this world is set in and it's phenomenal it builds up this fantasy of like this is a violent heavy world where you know everything's out of time but also time itself is just kind of broken and it ends with such a bittersweet painful ending there's supposedly more primal on the way but moving forward it's going to be an anthology series it's no longer going to follow um no i didn't yeah no have you watched it yet i have but i didn't know the yeah. news that you're yeah it is from here on out it is an anthology series it is no longer following the adventures of spear and fang for reasons that most people can probably guess based on that so son of a bitch <laughs> yeah God damn it. Yeah. Uh, Their story has come to an end. Uh, so that's Primal. Next up, honorable mentions while Tyler still digs through for his last category award. <laughs> this one almost... Digs through what? What are you talking yeah, about? This one almost won my eye candy award. It was Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the movie. Animated film directed by Andy Suriano and Ant Ward, available on Netflix. This is the best animation of any Ninja Turtles project, period. It is a highly intense, action-packed film from start to finish. Uh, it's got jokes and levity, but, like, it is some of the darkest stuff that they've done, at least in far as the television series, with the Ninja Turtles so far. And it is just, it's a be it's basically a good anime film with, like, the high-quality animation that they put into it. It's so fun. Go check it out. Uh, even if you haven't watched the show. You should watch the show too, The Rise of the TMNT. Don't listen to the haters; it's great. But like, yeah, it's yeah, phenomenal. It's fantastic. Uh, that'll, that'll be the third cosine for me. Um. Mm -hmm. Sonic Frontiers, video game developed by Sonic Team, produced by <laughs> Sega. This made it to my honorable mentions. Available on all major gaming platforms. This is the first open world, official, I should say, licensed open world sonic game where you can just run around wherever you want not just on a linear track and when you get to do that when the game is really focusing on that this game shines it is so so fun to go at like Mach 1 across an entire desert or an entire forest and just blast through, blow up enemies, jump around, like do your homing attacks and kicks and sw tornado swirls. Like that part is so fun. But the game is unfortunately bogged down with a lot of tedious side missions you have to do that break from the regular gameplay. A very weird in certain ways that I didn't expect from a Sonic story. Like more like generic high. Well, it's more like generic high sci-fi fantasy, sort of like a Final Fantasy sort of thing story, which 
is almost it's almost boringly weird <laughs> like like they do they really want you to take this story seriously but not in the sort of fun way that it was back in the adventure saga i don't know i wasn't i wasn't uh that huge impressed with the story and it was about ian flynn who does the comics which so it was, it was really a bit of a letdown and a really it ends in a bullet hell section, which is like a, t- a totally different genre of video game that they just decide to use there at the very end. So Sonic Frontiers is a very fun, but very flawed video game. And the last of my honorable mentions before Tyler gives us his last category and we move on to the best of the year. Uh, the last of my honorable mentions is Top Gun Maverick, directed by Joseph Kosinski. Uh, available on Paramount Plus. Uh, this one was surprised me because I really didn't give a shit about the original Top Gun. I went out and watched it with my parents one night. They wanted to go see it. It's got some fantastic practical effects and jet stunts that are all done in like real life, not just CGI. Like there is CGI, but like there's a lot of actual aerial stunts that they did. And it's so cool to just watch. Like it's it's one of the few movies I've watched where like I could just break out of the story for a little while and be like damn somebody did that that's so cool I am so happy that <laughs> we have something to commiserate about you, because you just you took you took a category from me so I'll just latch on Oh to no that. was that your last category <laughs> It wasn't my last category it was a category. Uh, of the many that you've um, narrowed down yeah Yes cuz I have categories within subcategories mm-hmm. coming up Anyway I like the first Top Gun, mm-hmm. but I don't love the first Top mm-hmm. Gun. And this is one of those movies, like like Puss in Boots or Puce and Puce Boots, and Boots. Um, where initially you're like, what the f-? <sighs> okay, whatever, another legacy sequel, okay. Now I love Tom Cruise, Scientology bullshit, notwithstanding. I'm a huge fan. He's so committed to giving you the best of what his movies can offer. And I think he's a better actor than some of his haters give him credit for. But still, Top Gun 2, I'm like, Neh. But then hype started to build. And people were like, Top Gun 2, good? Yeah. So by the time it comes out, like, it's getting incredibly good reviews. People are like, this is fucking awesome. I'm like, well, I got to see it. So I sit down and I don't know how to say this in a way that doesn't sound, you know, like, <laughs> kind of precious and kind of, kind of gatekeepy. But... It feels like the first time you see a just like a movie that you're going to love for the rest of your life. <laughs> like it gave me the feeling that I had like when I was younger where I'd watch something and just be completely sucked in. No pretense, no judgment, no irony. I'm just like I'm there for the ride because it's so perfectly calibrated. It's just like like Avatar 2, Way of Water. It's this big blockbuster movie. I know what like, is winning Tyler's Best of the Year award. <laughs> like, <laughs> Anyway, like, like that film uh, with all the water in it, it's completely sincere. It has no... There's no lamp shading. There's no irony. There's no sense that it's, it, 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 it doesn't poke fun at itself. It just tells this very straightforward simple story and about people you know and they're human and they're relatable and the fucking action in it like isaac said is like some of the most gripping that you've seen in a movie in a while because yeah there's like real jets doing real shit in the camera and the actors are actually in the jets as it's doing a lot of that shit so there's this tangible visceral quality to it that is just so refreshing to see on the big screen in you know current year <laughs> the, the the last act of this movie like if it wasn't for the movie with the liquid would be like one of the best last act action sequences that i've seen in like a decade or more it's that perfect yeah, Top Gun Maverick is a is a fucking movie. Like, that's how I can, that's the best way I can put it. It's a, it's fucking, a fucking movie. movie. <laughs> There's a reason it made a shit ton of money. There's a reason it was acclaimed. It's just it's a it's a movie. If if I had had <laughs> an out of cat or an out of nowhere category like you did, that was be the one that I would have given it to because like even over Puss in Boots, I had no no interest in Top Gun Maverick, and I just happened to go see it and be like. 
holy shit, that was so good. Oh, yep. Yeah, just bonding over Top Gun and uh, RRR. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Do you have your um, final category before we move on to the okay. best in show? How do I? How do? How do I break this? <laughs> How do you break it down to just one? I mean, you had so many. I had to cut you. I had to hold you back. Well, that's that's the thing. I'm not. I'm doing two. Oh boy! <laughs> I had a lot of honorable mentions, so it's fine okay. if you do two two categories. There's an umbrella category where they're kind of connected, and then they branch off into their own subcategories. Okay. The umbrella category is favorite polar opposites of the year, mm. and it just boils down to like tone and aesthetic and. On screen violence. Um, <laughs> so, the f- subcategory under favorite opposites of the year, and I kind of regret not picking this for a movie that would gross Isaac out the most. So, this is part two of movie that would gross Isaac out the most. The surprise smash box office breakthrough hit Terrifier 2. Terrifier 2 is the sequel to Terrifier. The first movie is a very, very low budget. Slasher movie with a killer clown named Art, and it is grimy and incredibly gory and mean spirited. And the second one is two hours and 20 minutes. It takes everything that fans loved about the first one and just dialed it up to 11. It is insane. It is wild. It's probably one of the most unrestrained, chaotically gory movies I've seen in theaters. Not ever. Because the reports of it being so violent, if you're a gore hound like me and you've seen what I've seen, it's, you know, you, you've seen this before. But as far as in theaters nationwide, people can actually pay to see it <laughs> with their family. Movies that I've seen on the big screen, this movie's nuts. So, what's the... And it would definitely gross eyes out What's the, the polar opposites element of this? <laughs> like how you're trying to like... Okay, yeah, cool. Terrifier 2, gross, killer clown. What's the No, no, no. I, oh, you meant two <laughs> different films that were opposites between each other. I yeah, thought you meant just within like the same... Night and day. I thought you meant within the no. same thing there were polar opposite elements. Okay, never mind. No, no, no. Just... just okay, you know, so opposite in... I'm just assuming something incredibly wholesome, heartwarming, Avatar The Way of Water. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong, boyo. Marcel the Shell with Shoes oh. on. The shorts, you know, they were huge, huge, huge hits on YouTube. Isaac, being the cl- closet cynic that he is, <laughs> because usually I carry around the coat of cynic, and Isaac is the big open-hearted optimist, but optimist? He's the <laughs> he's the optimist prime of secret cynicism. Mm. I sent him the trailer because the trailer itself just got me emotional for Marcel the Shell with Shoes on. You're like... Yeah, it could be cute, but like, you take a premise like that, it's probably not going to be a good full-length movie. This movie is so kind, and so sweet, and so cute, and so gentle, and (laughs) so just like quietly moving, it breaks your heart. You forget that you're watching a movie about a shell with, you know, little eyes and sneakers on it. (laughs) It's just, ah, it's such a heartwarming, heartwarming movie. That will sneak up behind you and make you misty-eyed, but like not in like a devastating way. So, yeah, if you just want to feel good, if you just want to have a nice laugh and wrap up in a warm, cozy blanket of a movie, watch Marcel the Show with you. Mm-hmm. Tyler, I hate to break this to you, but the film technically premiered at the Telluride Film Festival in 2021. No, festival runs do not count. I'm just fucking with you. Festival run. It do did not have, again. It's re- limited release in the U.S. in 2022, so it definitely counts. Okay, all right. So there's our category awards. Best of the year. Now, Tyler, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? I'll okay. go first. I'm sure um, this, no this, one is going this, to be able to guess what your best of the year is going to be. It's kind of an out of a left field pick. Mm-hmm. Um. Kind of had it hit into my back pocket. Mm-hmm. It's gonna blindside mm-hmm. some people, but um, I don't. I don't think many people have heard of it. Uh, it's called Avatar: The Way of Water. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> it's a sequel to like this really small indie film, independent yeah. movie. Not a lot of people saw in two thousand nine. Small name director too. Um, <laughs> like Top Gun: Maverick, it's just this. It's kind of fantastical spectacle filmmaking. 
that is pretty much just extinct. And for the good reason. This this whole thing is James Cameron's brainchild, and he cares so much about making every molecule of this world believable and immersive and telling this mythic story on this canvas that's not based on any other IP. It's not based off a book or an old show. It's not a spinoff. It's not an adaptation. It's its own original blockbuster IP. It's a world where the sheer execution of it transcends just being a cool setting or pretty eye candy. Half of the appeal is the fact that you fall in love with this world that these characters inhabit. In order to, uh, I mean, forgive me for being a little corny, but there's a bit of movieception going on with the Avatar movies, whereas Jake is obviously the Avatar as a protagonist into this new world. We are sort of avatars ourselves in that we're kind of vicariously experiencing this world as sort of like an unseen spectator or character in and of ourselves. It's just, it's immersive in a way that if you don't get it, then I, not everything's for everybody, but when people say that like they feel kind of depressed after seeing an avatar movie and stepping back into the real world, like that's no shit. That's not, that's not silliness. Cause I thought it was silliness at first because I liked the first one a lot, but I love the second one. And there's a moment and I'll shut up after this. There's a moment where the movie just kind of slows down and becomes a nature documentary for like five or six minutes. As we're just exploring this reef setting that the characters are in, I got a little emotional. I kind of teared up just, it, there wasn't anything dramatic happening. There wasn't any story happening. It was just them exploring their new home and being in that environment and seeing the sheer beauty of it was emotional. And then the whale blocks a missile with his head <laughs> and 10 out of 10 fucking amazing experience. <laughs> uh, the next one's about the fire tribes. <laughs> so, like, I feel like yes. they're shouldering in on Avatar The Last Airbender's territory <laughs> way too much. They already stole the name Avatar. Okay, no, no, no. no and I'm not saying this to be a jerk because I love the movies. James Cameron wrote the script for the first Avatar all the way back in 1995. So... The blue aliens came first, technically. Just saying. But it wasn't released until later. Yeah, but when people and also the term Avatar has been movies. around since Hinduism, Tyler. <laughs> so if you want to say that, they all stole it from that. <laughs> and the saying. last Airbender is more closely tied to its saying. mythological. I'm sorry, its theological roots. We got in trouble with this with RRR. I need to be a little more careful with how the way I use the word mythological. <laughs> There are some religions that would jump down my throat over calling it myths. <laughs> I've offended more than just Christians in this podcast. Okay, that's your best of the year, Avatar The Way of Water. I'm happy for you. Wow, you patronizing prick. <laughs> my best of the year award goes to Epithet Erased Prison of Plastic. I just cannot stress enough how much this book unzipped me. I just, like I was in sort of an emotionally vulnerable place when I listened to it on the audiobook, but even without that factored in, it is just such a it's such a sincere story that's so small scale while also having big dramatic moments all tied into this idea of like hiding within fantasy from our real world problems refusing to directly address the issues that we're having with each other the impotence of trying to communicate with someone who won't listen it's it hits on so many powerful heavy themes and all of it's framed through the perspective of a little girl who's just doing her best to hold her life together and it's so good it's so good like i watched the animated series of epithet erased on youtube and i really liked it it was a lot of fun it had some heartfelt moments but this saw this book pushes this franchise into a whole new level. it's it's a shame that this indie hit is probably never going to reach the level that other projects do like that it's going to probably remain just an indie sleeper hit and never really reach the same lofty heights as others. Well, 
Well, that that way you can be like a pretentious fan. I don't want to be a pretentious fan. Before, I want you know? everyone to enjoy <laughs> this. I want everyone to read this book and watch this short-lived animated series and realize just how much thought and creativity and cleverness and love and pain went into crafting this world and these characters. But yeah, it's it's very, very good. I highly recommend it. God, I might have to. Yeah. Did you ever watch the the animated series on YouTube? They're like 20 minute episodes and there's only like six of them. You might have like shared it at some point and I probably ignored it <laughs> um, because I had no idea. So the, the animated series is good. It's funny. It's cute. It's fun. And it does have some surprisingly touching and heartfelt moments. The book elevates it to a whole new level. It's it's big. I it, it's touched my heart in a way that a piece of media has not in a long time cool feels like we both had those moments yeah. last year um god i can't i want to do another category but we just had our big emotional <laughs> climax finale well this is tyler's <laughs> afterthoughts category what's your afterthoughts category if you have uh one of your own after i I've drop the category basically everything. of course you can share it after i didn't have as extensive do a, a list as you did I want to do a most underrated. Okay. Category. Okay. I want to say for underrated, let's represent some cape shit. Let's do some cape Kino. Um, the most underrated movie of 2022 is Black Adam. Not to get into the whole drama around the DC movies. Don't want to talk about it. Don't care. Just talking about a movie that happens to be a DC movie. The Rock stars as Black Adam, who is traditionally Shazam's arch enemy, but the past like 30, 35 years, they've kind of broken away from each other and they, they really don't share stories much anymore. So Black Adam is more of his own character than, than he had been mm -hmm. in the past. Stars of the Rock, it's it's his origin story, but told in a way that doesn't take up the entire first 45 minutes of the movie. As a sheer action movie in the superhero genre, this is one of the better ones we've had recently. The action is almost constant. Yeah. It's incredibly well done and designed and executed for how much visual effects is happening on screen. It's stylized. It's colorful. It's brutal in like ways that get like funny <laughs> <laughs> and it just kicks ass. It embraces just being a fucking nuts comic book movie in a way that feels mm -hmm. refreshing because it just throws a lot at you. Like, multiple characters and concepts and it doesn't try to make apologies for being an an unabashed comic book action mm -hmm. movie amid all the bombast you know it's it's pretty corny amid the corn there's a semi potent theme running through it of anti-imperialism yeah. and colonialism yeah. and the power of you know police forces mm -hmm. And the dichotomy between... And specifically the somebody, United States as imperialist. States, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's all there, and it's all cogent, mm -hmm. and, like, it doesn't go as far as you'd want stories that tackle these themes right. to Right, I feel like in the third act, it kind of loses think, some of its thematic w weight that it's pulling, but I agree with you. It, I, it really tries a lot more than a lot of other superhero it, material does. Yeah, it commits to the themes in a way that's more frank and upfront than some other superhero movies that tackle the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It does that surprisingly well while being a really, really fun action. Yeah, totally mm -hmm. agree. It's uh, one of the best DC films. Do you have a most underrated of your own or you just want to piggyback on Black <sighs> Adam? And the reason I picked it for underrated is because it got mostly bad reviews. Yeah, from critics on an audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got eighty eight, which is not bad. Oh, yeah. okay. But um, <clears throat> uh, I don't think I like bad shit, so I don't really have an <laughs> underrated one. <laughs> you fucking you ass pimple. Um. Yeah, I don't really have one. Like I said, with Epithet Erased, it's not that it's panned by critics or anything. It's that it's just not going to get the same kind of attention. It's never going to be like a huge, massive success, which that's where I feel like the sad part is. But yeah, I don't really have any this year that were like panned by critics. I was pretty normie, pretty normie this year. Everything I liked was uh, pretty well liked by everybody else. 
Sonic Frontiers was probably the closest, but even then, Sonic fans were like, this is freaking rocks! It got like a 7 out of 10! That's like a million points! <laughs> like, if you're a Sonic fan, you know that a 7 out of 10 is amazing for a Sonic game. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, I don't have any more categories, but I would like to do a post-show rant just because I'm feeling like okay. I'm ranting because I'm in the Okay, category. go for it. Go off, um, King. Let's talk about Morbius. Was Oh, shit. Was Morbius this year? Or last year? Morbius was this year. Morbius was this year, you, too. Oh, last year, too, Morbius? bro. I, that wasn't 2021. Are you sure? It was supposed to be, but it couldn't <laughs> be pushed back. First off, I still haven't seen it, so I have nothing to say about the film itself. But I got a feeling this commentary isn't about the actual film, more about the reception around it. Um, I'm not. Yes, I will say that it's it's really not the dumpster fire that the internet wants to make it out okay. to be. It's perfectly watchable and even mildly entertaining. Oh, what a ring um, endorsement that is. It has, well, I'm making a larger okay. point here. It has a very fun villain and not a very thought provoking or deep villain, but a villain that's fun to watch. And it has some creative action and visuals that make it stand out amongst other more popular uh, Marvel movies that came out last year, let's just say. Even though I'm not giving it a ringing endorsement and being like, oh, Morbius is this this underrated gem, it's mildly good. <laughs> perfectly mediocre. Okay. But I'm, the point I'm making okay. is I hate what the state of film discussion and discourse has become online. Because... It's, it speaks to how the internet in, you know, its quest to be as, like, unattached and unbothered and just meh about everything makes something a meme that feels so forced and so cynical and so jaded that you can smell and see the bandwagon coming from a mile off. Like, there's no reason Morbius should have been made, like, the laughing stock of 2022. It's just, it's such a, ugh, it makes engaging in your fandoms online annoying because it's just another example of how people like create a trend and latch onto a trend and, and just want to like perpetuate it just because it's a thing to do and it's popular. And like, <laughs> I know I'm rambling and sounding like a jackass, but just what happened to Morbius just pissed me off so much. Not because like it's a good movie, actually, quote unquote, but because of the way the internet creates narratives around art and, and somebody's creative endeavor that is unfair, let's just say. So, yeah. I don't have <laughs> There much, you go. You're probably going to cut I this. I don't have but. much to add to that conversation besides it's Morbin time. Oh, my <laughs> God. Fuck you. <laughs> I will. And I'm not. And, like, I am dead serious when I say this. I would rather watch... Morbius for a good time than sit down and watch a single frame of either Thor movie that Taika Waititi has made. <laughs> well, that's... I... Uh, that's because <laughs> let's just both put the Thor way. movies are awful and they make me actively angry, not just bored. <sighs> Morbius is an unironic fucking masterpiece compared to the Waititi oh Thor movies. God. Could you imagine... Okay, have you ever heard of that podcast, Worst Idea of All Time? Probably. It's liter okay, literally the premise is they watch a bad movie every week for a year and review it every week for a year. So like okay, 52 yes. episodes of the same before. movie. They've done like Grown Ups 2 and like Sex in the City 2. Like a bunch of terrible films. Could you imagine doing that with like Thor Ragnarok? Like torturing ourselves no. every week no. with Thor Ragnarok and forcing ourselves to watch it in perpetuity for a year. I imagine that this is a successful podcast and they make Oh, good much better than us. It. They're way more successful. <laughs> the reason I bring them up is because they have a tie-in with the McElroy brothers from My Brother and My Brother and Me. I figured they um, would. <laughs> and they, they with them, they do uh, Till Death Do Us Blart, which is a Paul Blart's <laughs> two, Mall Cop 2 review that they review every single year. This is, okay, you know what? Here's, here's my last minute category, the infinite podcast category. <laughs> <laughs> because Paul Blart 
uh, or Till Death Do Us Blart is a podcast about Paul Blart Mortal Kombat 2, hosted by the McElroy brothers and the guys from uh, Worst Idea of All Time. It will go on forever if they actually hold up the deal that they've made. Because the deal they made was they will continue to do this podcast every American Thanksgiving until they die. And when they die, they will choose a successor to replace them so that the podcast will go on in perpetuity until the end of time. (laughs) Just reviewing Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 over and over and over again. It's funny. (laughs) It's a funny it's a funny concept, it's a funny gag. It's very internet. Mm-hmm. That's like the most internet thing I've ever heard. Can you just um, imagine doing that to yourself though? <laughs> I I am imagining it. I'm imagining it and I we would have to be being paid fucking <laughs> stupid amounts of podcast money for me for me to do this and feel okay about it. Like I'd have to be making Joe Rogan mm-hmm. money off of this podcast to just do it <laughs> even to, just the once a year to be okay yeah, with it once a year it'd just be so much to watch a terrible film every year and have to review it again and again and again and find new things to say i wouldn't want to do that with my favorite movie. <laughs> so doing it for a movie i hate even for the lols even for the sweet moolah mm. no that's like <laughs> the biggest sellout of all time the best part is they started the year that that movie came out in 2015 and they've been going out for seven years fuck that okay i'm gonna immediately contradict myself and make a massive hypocrite okay. of myself if anybody is listening to this has the power to sponsor us <laughs> and make us wealthy off of this podcast i will commit to watching <laughs> Ragnarok. What, Thor Ragnarok? Oh no! No! Tyler, you've doomed us! You've doomed us, but this is the one that Pepsi's gonna listen to! Pepsi's gonna hear us! We're gonna hold it to that motherfucker! We're gonna. <laughs> we got him by the balls! And the monkey paw's finger clenches closed! <laughs> oh god, I. I guess that's going to do it for us for our first ever <laughs> award show here on Tongue and Geek. Remember when we said that we wouldn't talk about Ragnarok oh my anymore God. after we did a fucking three hour <laughs> <laughs> That promise was never going to last. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll, ch- I'll switch it to Love and Thunder because I think Love and Thunder is It's, yeah. Worse. It's at so. least equally as bad. <clears throat> anyway. Oh, you! I had this amazing idea. I should not say it on the podcast, but I'm going to anyway, because I don't want to actually put the work into doing it, but it's a funny idea. What if we, like, got... You know how you can do, like, AI voices where you can gather so much audio from somebody and you can basically just imitate their voice at this point because AI is horrifying and taking over everything? What if we did that with Uh our podcast, got the AIs to, like, memorize our voices to where they could make our voices say things and then ai generated a review of thor love and thunder so that we didn't have to do the review ourselves <laughs> you know that's probably relatively i was cool just if we wanted to take the time i to know i was just thinking it. like with the whole like controversy over ai art and stuff recently like what if we just ai podcasted like a review of love and thunder because we don't want to actually <laughs> put the time and work into reviewing that garbage <laughs> uh, there's multiple ways of doing that i'm sh- i'm sure if we wanted to make it decently palatable to the ear to mm-hmm. listen to for any amount of time we'd probably have to pay yeah for a decent algorithm or whatever ai yeah. generator that could produce long form audio for us in our voice yeah um or we could just like have a script made up and just read the script ai i don't want to read it though see like that's the, the, the yeah. whole thing is that like i don't want to put any effort into this i want to like bypass all of the effort <laughs> of actually having to think or talk about <laughs> thor love and thunder but have the episode anyway i'm wanting to be <laughs> like, well i mean that would be about as much effort as taika waititi put into the movie oh, oh shit. Shit. we really gotta I'm let him god go. i'm being such a hypocrite i'm being <laughs> such a hypocrite because i always say how i don't want to be that negative yeah guy. Acts jaded and cynical about movies. <laughs> God damn it, he brings it out of me. Like, come on, my titty. How? From praise, from praise, from our flag means we're real, death. We're real hot and cold on my titty. Real hot and cold on him. Yeah, he's. 
he's God. He's like he's like that problematic boyfriend that you have. Where you, <laughs> you love him so much, but you you feel like you got to let him mm-hmm. go sometimes. But he worms his way back in. All right. Well, I guess that's gonna do it for us. What a weird <laughs> ending to our first award show. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, give us a like, a rating, or a comment. Share us with your friends. I'm not even gonna bother plugging the social media anymore. Look us up on Tongue and Geek. That's gonna do it for us. Thank you for joining us to kick off season three. And remember. As always, don't throw your baby in the trash. <laughs>